Hello there, welcome to Biochemistry 1. My name is David Galina. I'm going to be taking you through a tutorial covering what you need to know for the units here. So we're going to start with Unit 1, the Introduction to Biochemistry. This is a unit where there's not too much to sink your teeth into. It's very broad information that it's going to make much more sense to you um, as you go through uh, Biochemistry 1 and 2 and beyond that. So, first tip, anytime you see a name, make a note of that. He likes to throw maybe a quote somewhere. So, common question. You notice the slide number is always going to be down here in this corner. <coughs> One of the most important things to get from this unit are the six non-metallic elements here. So you need to know that these four right here, hydrogen, oxygen, so our water, carbon, and nitrogen, make up more than 99%. Those are our top four. Phosphorus and sulfur are in fifth and sixth place. And know that these are all making covalent bonds. They're nonmetals. I see five ions here. They're not in red. This would be a good quiz question, so I would know these to play it safe, but it's not going to be a top priority to learn. This, however, is one you just got to memorize. You got to know which ones are bulk and which ones are trace. So, I mean, one tip is we know our top four and our top six. So that covers most of them here, we're going to add salt to the body, NaCl, NaCl, and we'll add these potassium and calcium. I don't have any real good tricks for memorizing the trace elements, you just gotta, just gotta know them. You see on the old tests and quizzes, this comes up every time, almost guaranteed. For this slide, know which ones are in highest, um, the percent is highest. So hydrogen is the highest percent, but also know the uh, percent or proportion. Um, also know the which one is the highest weight. So if you're going to do highest weight, you would say oxygen because it's so much heavier than hydrogen. But really, knowing these top four, you're going to be good. Your CHON again. Again, preview, this is unit 6 material, so don't worry about that too much. If I skip it, it's not important, or it's not important for the, uh, to do well on the tests. Anything goes on the quizzes. I've, I've given fair warning about that. The equilibrium constant, or KEQ, make sure to know those. Those will be used interchangeably. And free energy change, or the change in G, those are going to be used interchangeably. Make sure to know that. We'll come back to that in a few slides. This is some more overview material. We're going to talk a lot about metabolism in biochemistry too. For ATP, most important thing, just know the basics of the structure. So it has three phosphates here with a total negative four charge. Every time you take off a phosphate, ADP or AMP, you're going to lose one negative charge. I would know that you have a sugar and a base, and that makes up ATP, which is the universal currency of energy. Nucleotides and nucleosides are usually covered at the very end of biochemistry one, so don't worry about this for now. When I say don't worry about it, like I say, don't, don't really worry about this slide. I mean, don't stress over it for the test. It's very interesting. If you can understand it now, if you're reading the book, that's great. It's not going to help you do better in the class as of now. This is actually unit one material for biochemistry two. He just wants to give you an overview. Two major fuel molecules. Your body runs on sugar and fat, both carbon-based molecules. It's the oxidation of carbon, which is going to create ATP. These oxidation numbers are important to know. This comes up on every test, most quizzes. 
So know them. Uh, your, everything is based off of carbon. So this central carbon here, whichever carbon's highlighted. If it's attached to another carbon, or if it's attached to an R for the rest of the molecule, you're going to assume that is a uh, another carbon. It's going to be worth one number. Uh, if the carbon is attached to a hydrogen, it's going to be worth two. If it's attached to an oxygen, it's going to be worth zero. Zero, oxygen, worth zero. And you can kind of work through all the examples, or I'll explain this in SI if you need more clarification. But if you can remember this, carbon R is worth one, hydrogen worth two, oxygen worth nothing, you're good. Something that might come up is that carbon dioxide It has a number of zero, therefore it's not a fuel molecule. It's a waste product of your fuel molecules. Don't worry too much about these definitions. The laws of thermodynamics are really secondary priority stuff. Make sure you know all the stuff I'm saying is important before you spend time on this. I would consider this more um, secondary priority as well. It's, it's probably good to know extragonic versus endergonic. Know that anytime you have ATP plus water and you're taking it to say a ADP or AMP, it doesn't matter, um, plus the phosphate that popped off, this is going to be an extragonic process because the change in G is going to be negative. So th this is going to be an, a negative number. We're going to see that actual number later. This comes up quite frequently, so make sure you know only change in G can be used to make predictions about the direction and the final equilibrium position of the chemical reactions. Don't worry about it. Maybe you know that lab is in vitro, and anytime it's in life or in humans specifically, it's vivo. The only thing you have to know off those last three slides, there are so many numbers, do not worry about them, but you must memorize this equation. It will not be given to you, and you're going to need it on the quiz and the test. So make sure you know this. Very important. Free energy change equals negative 5.7 log of the equilibrium constant, KEQ, equals kilojoules over mole. Uh, the other thing to know is that KEQ is equal to B over A. If you remember from Gen Chem 2, uh, you have things that react and they form products. And then to get the equilibrium constant, you put products over reactants. So that's what B over A represents. But you'll need to substitute B over A it, if he gives you that information into this equation. The only thing you need to know on this slide are these two equations. You're taking ATP, you're hydrolyzing it with water, and you're going to pop off either one phosphate or two phosphates. And sorry about that. The technical difficulties. All right, we're back. Uh, the, you don't need to know kilocals over mole. You just need to know kilojoules per mole. So I would know the first one is about negative 31, and the second one is negative 46. You can round up. It's not that specific with these numbers. There are three factors here explaining the high energy of hydrolysis of ATP. We're going to see them listed again in a second, so I'm not going to uh, spend time on them. Why ATP? Here are those three factors again from the previous slides. One, two, and three. This is a very good one to know. I, you don't need to know the whole molecular formula, 
but know that ATP is a relatively small molecule that's water soluble. It has a high energy of hydrolysis. I'm sure you know why. And the next slide, it's stable and it can be rapidly generated. It can be rapidly generated from, uh, you have a little bit of storage, but phosphocreatine, glycogen, and fat are all sources of ATP. So I skipped one slide here, this magnesium slide. Um, just know that magnesium is required for these energy reactions. It helps stabilize the ATP or ADP. All right, standard free energy values. There are three um, that you need to know here. You don't really need to know the number. I, th I think it's helpful to know the order of them. But phosphoenolpyruvate, which is going to be abbreviated PEP. This is going to be abbreviated 1,3-BPG. And creatine phosphate doesn't really have an abbreviation, but in the future I'm probably going to put CR. Anytime you have this, there's a P circle that stands for phosphate. So know these three. We're going to talk about them a little more. So these these last slides, I skipped over them because there's this summary slide here. And remember when you went from uh, ATP plus water to ADP. The exergonic reaction was about a negative 31. So these two theoesters, acetyl-CoA and succinyl-CoA, both have about a negative 31 kilojoules per mole. So it's good to know these. Here are the big three I told you to know. Our friend PEP, phosphocreatine, and 1,3-BPG. The way they work, uh, the you pop off one of their phosphates in red here and that jumps onto the A making ADP ATP and then ATP can be used for energy. This represents a small amount of the energy produced or the ATP produced. It's mainly produced by oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to get to that at the end of the unit in a minute here. Um, secondary priority, maybe on a quiz you might see that transfer reactions are done by kinases, primarily. There are, uh, there are exceptions, but transferases or kinases, this is enzymes we're going to talk about in Unit 6. All right. Um, So reactions that use ATP are called ligations. The enzyme class is ligases. So if, you're, if you're adding things to ATP to get ADP, that's going to be done by ligases. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. It's going to be explained later. Um, maybe not until biochemistry too. But again, this is all overview material. Uh, stuff that you definitely will need to know comes right now on this slide. So there's two main ways of ATP synthesis. Make sure you know these two interchangeable. They all look the same. Oxidative phosphorylation um, is the other one that we're going to talk about. But know that if I call it substrate level phosphorylation or phosphoryl transfer, I'm talking about the same thing. So this is one way to make ATP. Only 5% of the ATP is made by this way. So this is the the not so popular way to make ATP. Benefit, you can do it without oxygen. Here are your kinases. This is the one catalyzed by kinases. So the uh, three molecules that we talked about earlier, those are the substrate level phosphorylation molecules. So these three come from PEP, 1,3-BPG, 
uh, I'm sorry, or creatine phosphate. So these three create ATP through substrate level phosphorylation or phosphorylotransfer. The other way to make it, the much more popular way, 95% of it, is done by oxidative phosphorylation. So oxygen is always needed for oxidative phosphorylation. It's an easy way to remember it. This is done in the mitochondria. And the enzyme is ATP synthase. So who makes the ma most ATP? ATP synthase. Um, I'm trying to think, it might have said this on another slide, but about substrate level phosphorylation, this happens in the cytosol. So this one is in the cytosol versus mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation. Secondary priority, I've seen this happen on a, or come up on a quiz before that the gradient is created by the oxidation of fuels that pumps protons out. And there's a gradient used influx of protons th to form ATP. I had no idea what I, this was talking about at the time. If you don't either, that's okay. This is covered in biochemistry two in great detail. But for now, no, it's this, this flow, uh, this proton gradient is the, the key point to get protons and electrons, that's what is helping make the ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. The last two slides are also very important. They come up all the time. There are two types of reactions. There's going to be these near equilibrium reactions or far from equilibrium reactions. So for near equilibrium, KEQ and Q are very similar. We have a small change in G. These enzymes are not regulatory. They're re reversible. Reversible meaning they can go in both directions. And the reaction is not a control point. So reaction is not, not a control point, non-regulatory. Those kind of go hand in hand. Reversible, both directions, those go hand in hand. So it looks like a lot of information, but there's not too much being said here. Although this does come up on a lot of, uh, you know, pick which one is false about this type of question. That'll make more sense when we see some examples. Um, K, E, Q, and Q are very different significantly in the far from equilibrium reactions. Change in G is a large negative. The reaction is irreversible. It might be regulatory. Not all of them are. The reaction only goes forward, and it may be a control point. So for far from and near equilibrium reaction, just if you know one of them, you kind of know the other. They're kind of opposite ends. And I think that's all I have for unit one.